This is our second video for Chapter 4. We're going to start out here talking about multiple step experiments. So if we have an experiment that has more than one step, then what we do is look at how many possible results there are for each different step. And then to get the total number of outcomes in the experiment, we just multiply those numbers for the total possible results together. So if we had n1 possible results for the first step, n2 possible results for the second step, and so on, then our total number of outcomes is going to be the n1 times the n2, and so on, so that we include each different step. One way that you can represent this graphically is with a tree diagram. The only problem with tree diagrams is that they don't work very well if you have lots of steps or lots of outcomes in each step. Your tree can quickly get very, very large and could take up a whole floor's worth of paper. Tree diagrams are great for smaller problems where you have just a couple steps or maybe three or four steps and just a few outcomes in each step. They're a good way to help you understand how to deal with a multiple step experiment in the small case. Here's an example of a multiple step experiment. Let's say that we have five students and we're going to select two students at random from these five. The first student we select is going to be asked to lead a group discussion. The second student selected is going to be asked to take notes of the discussion for the group. So we have two different students selected and they get two different jobs. The question is how many possible outcomes are there for this experiment? This is a two-step experiment because we're selecting the first student, that's our first step, and then the second student, that's our second step. So we want to look at how many possible outcomes there are for the first step and how many possible outcomes there are for the second step. For step one, since we had five students, there are five possible outcomes. So any one of the five students. For step two, since we've already selected one of our five students, we're not going to select that student again. So in this case, we only have four students left to select from. So for step two, there are four possible outcomes. Now to get the number of possible outcomes for the experiment as a whole, we're going to multiply those two results from the two steps. So the total number of outcomes for the experiment is 5 times 4, so it's 20. Another problem to do with this, let's say that two out of the five students are female. Then what's the probability that the first student selected is a female and the second student selected is male? We already know how many outcomes or how many samples sample points there were in our sample space. That was part A, so that was 20. If we want to find the probability of this event that we're talking about, we can figure out how many different ways it can happen and then divide it by our total number of events in our sample space. So let's look at this being a specific event that the first student selected is female and the second one is male. For the first step of our experiment, in this case we're selecting a female. There are two ways to do that because there are two female students in the group. For the second step, we know we want to select a male. If there are two female students in the group, that means there are three males. We still have the three males I have to choose from for step two, so there are three ways that we can do that. So our total number of ways to get the first student female and the second student male is two times three, so it's six. Now to get our probability, we're going to take the number of ways our event can happen, which is 6, and divide it by the number of sample points in our sample space, which is 20. So we ended up with 6 divided by 20, which comes out to be 0 0.3, or 30%, if we want to put this in percentage form. Complementary events. This is something that becomes very important a couple chapters down the road, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this. The complement of an event A and in this book, they use a superscript C to denote a complement. The complement consists of all the outcomes in which the event A does not occur. So it's like the opposite of A occurring. Here's an example of this. In an article about investment growth, Money Magazine reported that drug stocks show powerful long-term trends and offer investors unparalleled potential for strong and steady gains. Many individuals age 65 and older rely heavily on prescription drugs. For this group, 82% take prescription drugs regularly. Consider a randomly selected individual that's 65 or older. If 
A is the event that the person takes prescription drugs regularly, then the complement of A is just the opposite of that. So it would be the event that the person does not take prescription drugs regularly. So in other words, with a complement, it can either be one or the other. Some rules for complementary events, and these involve the probabilities, since an event and its complement basically have to add up to the whole sample space, then that means that the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement has to add up to one, because the probability of the whole sample space is one. So that gives us a couple of other little formulas. The probability of a complement is just one minus the probability of a. So for example, if we already know the probability of an event, we can find the probability of its complement just by subtracting from one. Then the same thing with the probability of a. If we already know the probability of the complement, we can find the probability of a by subtracting from one. Here's another way to look at this with Venn diagrams. If we look at our whole sample space as being this blue rectangle, then we've got event A in the yellow circle. A complement would be everything that's outside of the yellow circle. So that you can see how if we put A and A complement together, then we end up with the whole sample space. Now if we look at probabilities this way, again if we're looking at the probability of the whole sample space, so everything inside of the purple rectangle, that whole area has to be one. Now if we have the probability of a specific event being in the circle, then the probability of its complement is going to be everything that's outside the circle, and that's going to be one minus what was in the circle, because our total area of our whole rectangle was one. So you can see from this that if we put A and its complement together, just as sets, then we get the whole sample space. If we put the probability of A together with the probability of its complement, if we add those two together, we always get one. Let's go back to our prescription drug example. For the group of individuals 65 and older, 82% take prescription drugs regularly. So if we look at A being the event that a randomly selected person 65 or older takes prescription drugs regularly, then the probability of A is going to be 82% or 0.82. What if we want to find the probability of A complement? Remember the complement of A was that a randomly selected person 65 or older does not take prescription drugs regularly. Well to get the probability of A complement we're just going to subtract the probability of A from 1. So that would be 1 minus 0.82 which would give us 0.18, or if we think of this in percentage form, instead of 1 minus 0.82, we'd have 100% minus 82%, which gives us 18%. Another concept that we need to think about with probabilities is if we're looking at the probability involving the union of two events. And union, when we're talking about sets, union corresponds to the word or. So if we're looking for the probability that event A occurs or event B occurs, then what we need to do is find the total number of ways that A can occur and the number of ways that B can occur and add them together. But we have to do this in a way so that no outcome is counted more than once. We don't want to overcount anything. Another way we can think of this is strictly with the probabilities. So if we're talking about A or B, that's the same as finding the probability of A union B. So those two mean the same thing. The addition rule says that the probability of A union B is just the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. The reason that we subtract the intersection is so that we don't count anything twice. In other words, if there's an overlap between A and B, then if we're just adding the probabilities of A and the probabilities of B, we're going to be counting that overlapped part twice. So we have to subtract it once to get rid of the overlap. Now, if A and B are mutually exclusive, or in other words, if they're disjoint sets, if they don't have anything in common, then their intersection is the empty set. In other words, there's nothing there and that means the probability of A intersection B is going to be zero. So in that case, 
the probability of A or B, or in other words, the probability of A union B is just the probability of A plus the probability of B. This is something you always have to be thinking about, though, is whether A and B are mutually exclusive or not. Back to our survey example. Here are the results we had from the survey. And now we want to look at what is the probability that a randomly selected person from this group is over 65 or female. So here we're looking at the probability of a union of two sets. We're finding the probability of over 65 or female, which is the same as over 65 union female. So we need to count how many respondents fit either of these two categories or both without counting anyone twice. If we add all the cells for the over 65 category, that would be this cell and this cell, that's 9 and 16, we get 25. If we add the cells for the female category, there are three values there, 4, 19, and 16. If we add those three, we get 39. If we add the 25 and the 39, though, we've actually counted this cell twice, the one that's female and over 65. There are two different ways to get around this problem. One is to go ahead and add those totals, the 25 and the 39, and then subtract the intersection, so subtract the 16. Another way is to simply mark all the cells in the table that fit the criteria for event A and add them. So in other words, we'd look at 4, 19, 16, and 9, and we just add those four numbers together. That's an easy thing to do if you have the values represented in a table like this. Either way we do it, we should end up with a total of 48 ways that event A can occur. In other words, 48 respondents that were either female or over 65. So our probability that the respondent is over 65 or female would be 48 over our total number of respondents, which was 80. And that's going to come out to be 0.6 or 60%. We can also calculate this with probabilities. So we could calculate the probability of someone being over 65. We did that earlier and that was 0.3125. The probability of someone being female in this group, we would add up everyone in the female category and divide by 80. So that gives us 0.4875. And then we would find the probability that someone is over 65 and female. So we just look at this one cell, 16, divide by 80 to get 0.2. And then we would use that addition rule, which said that we take the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of their intersection. So we take the 0.3125 plus the 0.4875 minus the 0.2. And that would give us 0.6 again.